Many people may be already familiar with the term gospel, but they may have negative associations with it because of bad experiences interacting with people proclaiming to preach it. The most important thing we have to understand is that the gospel is good news. You can't threaten people with good news, yet throughout history, we know there were Christians who had a track record of trying to force convert people or persecute people into becoming believers. And that actually is not what the gospel is. And the apostles nor Jesus follow this model. There's no way to threaten someone into believing something they don't already accept internally. Anything and everything we believe is something that we receive and accept in our own heart. Even if you put a gun to someone's head, it's not going to make someone believe something. They may lie and say they believe it because they don't want to die, but internally they're not really true believers. If the good news is eternal life, then you can't threaten someone's life. That doesn't make any sense. Christians don't lose if non-Christians don't believe in it. It's the people that reject it that miss out. And ultimately, God judges them for their sins throughout their lives because they do not receive the mercy that was offered through Jesus. They don't have to be punished for their sins. Jesus could take the price of that punishment for them so that they can be free and they will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to receive the power to overcome their sin nature and be counted as righteous. This is what the gospel is about. The word gospel comes from the old English word Godspell, which is a compound word made of the words God meaning good and spell meaning news. And when combined, they make the phrase good news. Um, in Christianity, the phrase is used in reference to the good news about Jesus Christ since the New Testament was preserved from the first century in Greek. And the phrase good news is written as the Greek word euangelion. This phrase isn't only associated with Christianity, but it also has secular usage. It was used with decrees made by rulers like the emperor of Rome. The followers of Jesus used this phrase for their own king and savior, Jesus Christ. The title Christ, Christios in Greek means to anoint. And this title was assigned to Jesus because he claimed to be the anointed holy one sent by God. This could have been seen as a challenge to the Roman Empire since the emperor claimed to be the highest power in all the land and he expected to be viewed as godlike in his authority. So it seemed likely that the phrase euangelion or good news was deliberately chosen by Jesus' followers to declare that Jesus was the highest authority and that his followers served a higher kingdom than any earthly kingdom and that they were bringing greater news than anything Caesar can offer. So what is the good news about Jesus? Imagine that you owed a debt that you couldn't pay back, and it would cost you everything if you didn't pay it back by the deadline. But then someone else offered to not only pay your debt, but also provide all of your needs for the rest of your life. All they ask in return is that you be adopted into their family and let them train you to live a new lifestyle. In the process, you would receive an inheritance and would remain debt-free. Or imagine that you're proven guilty of a major crime, but the judge offers community service instead of life in prison. This is what the good news about Jesus teaches. We owe God our lives for our sinful behaviors, and death is how we pay him back. Yet Jesus offers a covenant where he atoned for our sins, and in exchange there is an inheritance of eternal life. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, those in covenant with Jesus are promised a future resurrection from the dead, just like Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead three days after being executed. Furthermore, this new eternal life comes with the new body that is free from corruption and the sin nature that makes us all do these wicked acts that God rejects. And we are born with this sin nature. The phrase born again is used by Jesus when describing to Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader at the time, the requirements for entering his kingdom of God in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. In the meantime, the followers of Jesus are given the power of the Holy Spirit to help them overcome the sinful desires of their human bodies until they die. Essentially, everyone will still die because of the sin nature we were born with, but the lives of those whose sin debt was paid by Jesus are returned to them permanently as a rebate. Meanwhile, those who didn't receive this covenant will face condemnation for their sins on Judgment Day, which results in a permanent second death, according to Revelations chapter 20. In the eternal kingdom of God, there will be no sin because those who received God's spirit will be transformed with new bodies and renewed minds, so they'll be free from slavery to the sin nature they were originally born with. In John 8, 31 through 36, Jesus said that he, the son of God, came to set people free. When his audience asked what he offered freedom from, 
as they did not consider themselves slaves to anyone or anything, he said he offered freedom from slavery to sin. Humans are slaves to sin nature since birth, and that is why Jesus said we must be born again. In John 14, 15 through 21, and John 16, 5 through 15, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes after he ascends to heaven to help renew the minds of the followers of Jesus and empower them so that they could teach and show others the ways of his kingdom. This is what we are to do until he returns. One important question to ask is, what is sin? The word sin in the Bible is translated from the Hebrew word chata, which means failure or missing the mark. And we sin against God when we fail to keep his instructions. God gives us life and has the right to end it when we reject his ways. He must execute justice against those who fail to follow instructions. When we fail to keep God's instructions, then we are guilty of breaking his laws and deserve death. The Apostle Paul summarized this concept in Romans 6.23 by saying that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. However, he can substitute our death with another life, and Jesus is the one whose life was substituted for ours. This is why the ancient Israelites used animal sacrifices to cover their sins, so they could stay in God's presence. God's presence is holy and naturally resists the corruption of sinful behavior, so something that had to die to cleanse the people who wanted to interact with God. Things that represent death or corruption cannot be in God's presence. This is why the Israelites had prohibitions on what they touched or ate before they go to the tabernacle or temple. They had to follow certain ritual purity customs given in the Law of Moses just to have God's presence among them. The sacrifices of specific animals representing sinlessness could be made as a temporary atonement for sin, but there were limitations on this because humans were made in the image of God and distinct from animals, so no animal could ever truly replace a human. Therefore, only a human can fully substitute for a human, but since no human was sinless, no human could qualify to function as a substitute for humanity. This means the solution is that there needs to be a sinless human and it was prophesied by Israelite prophets in the Tanakh or Old Testament that there would be a man who would fulfill that role, who would rule as a king over a recreated world and function as a new priest who mediates a new covenant between God and man. It was humans that broke the initial covenant, so it had to be another human that corrected that failure. So naturally, the next question is, where did sin actually come from? In Matthew 22, 34 through 40, Jesus said the greatest two commandments were to love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, which is from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, and love your neighbor as yourself, which is from Leviticus 19, 18. Humans fail to keep these commands all the time. Humans often lie, cheat, steal, kill, and indulge in sexual lust, violence, and greed at the expense of others. This pattern of failing to trust God and following our own desires has continued in humanity ever since the failure of the first humans, and this is the explanation for why we die according to God's word. According to Genesis chapter 3, the first humans named Adam and Eve failed at keeping God's instructions. They followed the advice of a rebellious spiritual leader and deceiver known as Satan and stole from God, which cost them their lives. God warned them beforehand that the consequences will be death. However, instead of trusting God, they trusted Satan when he called God a liar and followed their own desires, seeking to become like God, which is a false promise Satan made, claiming that God was holding out on them and holding back something that they needed, despite the fact that God provided everything they needed. The ancient patriarchs that the Bible references later on in Genesis, like Noah, Abraham, and Abraham's descendants, were called righteous but often fail to keep God's instructions themselves because no natural-born human is perfect. They were classified as righteous not because of their ability to be perfect followers of God, but rather their faith in God's promises and their desire to please God and receive from Him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, It is impossible to please God without faith, and that anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that He exists and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Faith is synonymous with the word trust. If Adam and Eve had faith and trusted what God initially said, despite Satan's temptations, they would not have fallen for it. Likewise, the rest of us fall for these traps that are designed to deviate us from God's plan because we don't trust God's plan and instead often lean to our own understanding. Paul says in Romans 3.23, 
that for every one has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Sin is a failure to love God and our neighbors the way God intended, and this failure was initiated by the first humans and instigated by spiritual rebels like Satan and those who followed him. In Genesis 3.15, there is a promise that one of the humans would come to defeat Satan and rescue humanity from slavery to sin. God wanted humans to be free from slavery to sin, so he made Jesus the way of escape. But each individual must accept the covenant Jesus offers in order to get the promise of freedom from sin and death. Otherwise, they will stay trapped by sinful impulses and will be condemned for their sinful behavior on Judgment Day. Your next question may be, well, what happens if I don't believe? What if I don't want eternal life or don't want to worship the God of Abraham? While the gospel is indeed good news, there are consequences to rejecting it. Imagine if you came across a starving, thirsty traveler in the desert and you wanted to help them. So you told them of a nearby oasis with food and water. However, they rejected your info because of pride or mistrust, and they died. Christ calls himself the bread of life and the source of living water. So if the good news about him is like bread and water to those in need, and they receive it, they will be refreshed. But if they don't, they will starve and die. The offer is freedom from sin and eternal life. But it is only available to those that want it. The covenant of eternal life is available to everyone, but not everyone will receive it. Sin is the reason for death, so God won't give eternal life to people who want to stay sinful. Freedom from sin is the requirement for eternal life, and only Jesus promises this kind of freedom. Remember, we are all guilty of sin and owe God our lives, so none of us can earn this, nor was God obligated to save us. Yet he made a promise to do so anyway because he wanted to. However, he will not force anyone to accept this covenant of deliverance and redemption. People must be willing partakers in this eternal inheritance. Jesus said in John 3, 16 through 21, But this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son in the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. Those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see what they are doing is what God wants. Jesus says in Matthew thirteen twenty four through 42 that there will be a judgment day when the wheat, those who are born again as righteous, are separated from the weeds, those who choose to stay in darkness. He says the wheat are stored in the barn, but the weeds are burned. This parable functions as an analogy for the final conclusion of God's finished plan to save humanity. He is only interested in saving those who want to be saved from their fleshly desires. This means that those who take pride in their indulgences and refuse to let them go have no place in a perfect sin-free world because they don't want to be free from sin. If God lets people who refuse to change into a new eternal world that is sin-free, then how can it be sin-free? The next question may be, is God even justified in condemning wicked people? What makes him so right? According to Ezekiel 18, 23-32, God doesn't enjoy punishing the wicked, but has to for the sake of justice for their victims. However, God will show mercy to those who repent. Similar ideas can be found in Isaiah 57, 15-21, Jeremiah 18, 1-10, Ezekiel 33, 10-12, and 33, 17-20. Psalms 7, 1 through 17, and Psalms 32, 1 through 11. In Genesis chapters 6 through 9, God flooded the world to stop mass violence. In chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, it says that God observed that everything humans thought or imagined was constantly evil, so he grieved that he even made humans and decided to do something about it. Long before the flood, in Genesis chapter 4, Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve, murdered his brother Abel. 
God showed him mercy by marking him with a mark that came with a curse on anyone that harmed him. Cain's descendant, Lamech, murdered a man and claimed that God would give him 70 times the mercy and protection that Cain was given. God never promised this, but Lamech just made it up and created a culture of murder where people competed for a false reward of protection gained by murder and violence. I call this the Murder Olympics. This is why the earth was filled with violence according to Genesis 6.11 and why God needed to use the flood to reset humanity. After the flood, when Noah got off the ark in Genesis 9.5-6, through 6, God had to institute the death penalty for murder. This was necessary to stop humans from repeating the culture of chaos and violence. The Bible frames God as one who must balance both justice and mercy. Therefore, when we read about stories of God's wrath and judgment, we have to put ourselves in his position. If they are murderers like Cain, then there must be murder victims like Abel. Think about this. If there were men who weren't strong enough to kill other men, then they would likely go after women and children. Furthermore, it's easy to imagine that men and women would simply just kill their babies to get this special mark. So it's possible the concept of child sacrifice was likely invented in this era. Moreover, when we look at Revelation chapter 6, 9-11, through 11, it says the martyrs who were killed for following Jesus are crying out for justice, and God reassures them that they only have to wait a little longer for it. This is similar to Genesis 4, 10 through 11, when God cursed Cain and says that Abel's blood cries out from the ground. God is the avenger of martyrs and will punish those who persecute his people. We are all guilty of sins, but Jesus took the punishment for us so that we wouldn't have to endure condemnation. That's why God can show mercy without it contradicting justice for those whom we have wronged, which includes both God and other humans. Again, this only applies to those who receive this covenant and they must be willing to stay committed to it even in the face of persecution or martyrdom. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, was a persecutor of Christians, but then he received the new covenant of Jesus himself and became a Christian and was forgiven of his sins. If Paul didn't receive this covenant, then Jesus' death would not apply to him and he would be condemned on Judgment Day, along with everyone else that went around persecuting people by murdering and imprisoning them. In addition, believers receive the Holy Spirit, who helps them overcome the sinful desires produced by their bodies. According to Galatians 5.16, when people follow the ways of the Holy Spirit, they will not be held back by the lustful desires of their flesh. The body naturally rebels against God, but the Holy Spirit is interested in keeping God's instructions. Later in Galatians chapter 5, in verses 22 through 23, Paul teaches on the fruits of the Spirit which are love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faith, patience, meekness, and self-control. According to Romans chapter 8, having the Holy Spirit is what distinguishes believers from the world. There are Christians who go through the motions but don't really accept all of what Jesus taught because they love sinful ideologies too much to let them go and there are major consequences to this. Believers must accept and live by the teachings of God's word. The next question one may have is, then why does God give us the freedom to choose rebellion if he doesn't like it. So the covenant that God offers is like a marriage proposal to us. A daily, a man wants to marry a woman who chooses him because she wants him, rather than a forced marriage with someone who hates him. There is more value in something when there is a risk of losing it. So love that has risk of going unreciprocated is more valuable than pre-programmed automated love. Similarly, God wants more valuable, risky, yet genuine love. An automated voice assistant can be programmed to say, I love you, but that is not the same as a living being choosing to love you. If God wants robots, then he would have made robots. However, he didn't, because there is more value in something when there is a risk of not having it. In Genesis 3, 22 through 24, God put Adam and Eve out of the garden to prevent them from getting eternal life from the tree of life. This implies that while God can bring everyone into his eternal kingdom, as we are, corrupted by sinful nature, he won't because that would be a bad idea. Human wickedness and evil would go on forever, and there would be no permanent consequences for heinous and malicious behavior, since there would be no death. Death is necessary to stop human wickedness from going on forever. Genesis 6.11 says that God flooded the world as a soft reset because the earth was filled with violence. If God did nothing, then humans would kill each other off and destroy the world. On the other hand, if he killed us all, including Noah, there would be no one left. Either way, he wouldn't be able to keep his promise to save humanity from Genesis 3.15. God uses death to execute judgment 
and bring justice to the victims of human evil. But he also knows that all humans are corrupt and wants to rescue us from that wickedness. Not everyone will accept God's proposal, but that is the risk that God is willing to take in order to get a more valuable love response. Those that do accept will be extended and undeserved mercy afforded them by Christ's sacrifice, and those that don't will have to face justice for whatever they've done. Mercy is available to everyone, but not everyone will receive it, so that only leaves justice. God would not be a just God if there was only mercy and no justice, and there would be no humans left if there was only justice and no mercy. The choice he gives us is how he balances the equation. So the last question you may have is, how is any of this good news? Well, the good news is that despite our wickedness, pride, and selfishness, our creator who wants us to embody his holiness created a special, unique, sinless human who is qualified to take the consequences of his justice for us. He did this so that we could be returned to a holy state with new bodies free from the rebellious, sinful nature that plagues us and receive eternal life. In addition, God's Holy Spirit bonds with us to help us take on his nature, his love, and become more like God by teaching and empowering us to live holy lifestyles. The eternal kingdom of heaven itself is ruled by Jesus, the one who descended from heaven to earth for us, according to Ephesians 4, 1 through 10. This is a kingdom, not a democracy. So the rules that define sin in the Bible are the same rules that govern God's kingdom. So those who don't agree with God's rules in scripture don't agree with the kingdom of heaven and therefore would naturally reject the kingdom. The choice is yours. God is setting before you life and death. And according to John 5, 25 through 29, Jesus said on judgment day that there will be two resurrections, one for those who have received the covenant of eternal life that will never die again, and one for the rest of humanity who are condemned to destruction. A clear description of judgment day is written in Revelation chapter 20. God doesn't want sinful people to have eternal life because their sinful behavior, like the violence of Noah's day, would last forever, and there would be nothing but destruction. At the same time, God loves humanity and doesn't want death to end us all. If death is the necessary outcome of sin, then God must eliminate sin so that people can be free from death. However, in order to maintain free will, choosing this offer must be optional. Christ, the sinless one, died in our place so that we wouldn't have to be condemned for our sins, and we were made righteous so that we could receive God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us to live God's way in preparation for new sin-free bodies that have eternal life. This is good news, and we don't deserve it, yet it has been made available for us. So I urge you to choose life because it's worth it. A final word on all of this. Jesus Christ and his gospel promise the kingdom of heaven will take over this earth and remake it, adding the gift of eternal life to the humans that enter into a covenant with its king. You can't follow an alternative theology and expect the same rewards promised by Christ. Worshipping idols or your ancestors or anything in nature will not give you a resurrection to eternal life. No religion outside of Abrahamic theology offered what Christ offers. Most gods in various cultures are interested in living holy and do wicked things to both humans and each other. For example, Zeus consistently cheats on his wife, Hera. In fact, the famous Hercules, or Heracles, is not even Hera's son. He's the product of Zeus committing adultery. Even the religions and righteous deities that instruct humans to do the right thing never gift us the power to do so through the Holy Spirit. Nor is there a promise of resurrection, which is a return to the earth from the dead, with a promise to never die again, also known as eternal life. Imagine you're trying to make an apple pie, and you go to the electronics store looking for apples. All they can offer you is devices with apple logos on them. They can't offer you actual food, because you are shopping in the wrong place. Christianity is the only theology that promises the Spirit of God that transforms our hearts and frees us from enslavement to sin and a resurrection followed by permanent life with no death. This eternal life is promised under the construct that the wages of sin are death, which means that if the sin is removed, then there's no need for death, and life can be lived forever. Anyone who doesn't believe this should not expect to inherit eternal life from the only God that actually promises it. Many religions around the world have deities that represent death or are masters of the afterlife, and no god of death wants to be the ruler of nothing. So why would they let the dead come back to the earth? Jesus said that his father is only the God of the living, not the dead, in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two. 32. In Revelation chapter 20, it even tells us that those that reject Jesus' atonement for their sins have to be resurrected on judgment day, 
so that God can judge them for their sins, because he doesn't judge them while they are dead. He must judge them as living beings. Those that reject the kingdom will be condemned to the lake of fire, and therefore removed from the earth, because the earth will be made new. Only those who are in the kingdom will inherit it, because the kingdom of heaven will conquer the world, and there is no place for rebels who hate God and his eternal kingdom. Expecting to receive eternal life in a kingdom where you hate the king is like expecting to go to a country where you made threats against their leader and promise to break every law they have out of spite because you hate them. You will most likely be prevented from even entering the place. So why should we expect the kingdom of heaven to be any different? No one who actually loves God would want to rebel against him. And everyone and anyone that rejects the gospel and hates the kingdom of God and everything it stands for doesn't even want to be a part of the kingdom, nor do they want eternal life. That's their choice and their decision. They rejected good news, like food and water, for a starving and thirsty traveler, and they will die in their sin because they refuse to consume the only thing that could save them. Remember, it doesn't make any sense for a sinless eternal kingdom to receive people who won't let go of their sins. It's like going through airport security and trying to bring liquids from the outside. They're going to reject you and make you pour it out at the gate. You have to pour out your sin to come to the sinless eternal kingdom. Receiving Christ and the Holy Spirit are the prescribed methods of doing that. The significance of the kingdom being sinless is that sin is the reason for suffering, which means that this eternal kingdom will have no suffering because the sin is removed. This is good news, and this is what Jesus is offering. Who wouldn't want this? This is Michael Campbell from Hearts to Understand. This is my explanation of the gospel. If you want more, like and subscribe, and I'll talk to you later.